Okay, uh, and then let's welcome our next speaker. Um, Gary Falia Gauna came from Greece, has a master's degree in molecular biology, joined the Mika Siemens lab to pursue her PhD in systemic neurosciences in Ludwig Maximilian uh, University of Munich out of Germany. Her drive to be a scientist starting when she was a teenager, reading this quote from Marie Skoldowska Curie, um, quote, I'm among those who think that science has great beauty. A scientist in his laboratory is not only a technician, he is also a child placed before natural phenomenon, which impressed him like a fairy tale. Quote. So let's welcome Garifalia to share with us her fairy tale today. Thank you very much, Jingping, for the lovely introduction. Um, Welcome, I think in Germany is um, afternoon or evening, uh, while in the US it's morning, so I don't know what to say, good morning or good afternoon, uh, from wherever you're uh, uh, reaching us. So let me share my screen. Good. So uh, welcome, uh, I would like, uh, before beginning uh, my presentation, I would like to thank uh, uh, Open Box Science for the um, opportunity giving me to present my uh, paper from my PhD project. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate you guys. Uh, this is a fantastic initiative. Um, so um, today I would like uh, to talk about uh, um, um, how can I say, uh, the first part of uh, my PhD, uh, which uh, uh, ends up with uh, this paper. Um, so I joined uh, Mikael uh, Simons uh, lab in uh, the Dizedene in Munich um, two and a half years ago uh, as, uh, during my Erasmus internship. And I was really, really uh, lucky to collaborate with uh, Ludovico Cantuti Castelvetri and uh, right away, like I remember from uh, the first day that uh, we started uh, working on this project together. Um, so without further ado, um, a brief introduction regarding myelination, uh, why myelination is so important. So human myelination actually uh, begins uh, uh, mostly postnatally uh, in, early, in childhood. Uh, uh, in, actually mostly in childhood and uh, develops until early adulthood. Um, so the success of uh, uh, the successful, uh, how can we say, so why myelination is so important, uh, the success story uh, behind this is uh, the fatty envelope, which we call the myelin seed. Um, and here you can see, um, I'm sorry, can you see the cursor of my mouse? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so here you can see the uh, undamaged myelin scenes that the, it is actually a fatty envelope surrounding the action of the neuron. And uh, when this is uh, undamaged, uh, we have a successful um, uh, electrical uh, signals uh, from uh, one neuron to another neuron in the brain. But uh, when uh, the myelin seeds uh, are damaged, as you can see here, the messages along uh, the brain uh, uh, are distorted. So um, uh, um, during demyelination, which is actually one of the features of uh, uh, some um, diseases like multiple sclerosis, uh, we have the uh, destruction of the myelin seed, as you can see here, and uh, particularly in multiple sclerosis, uh, this is due to of the pathological activation of macrophages and T cells. Um, but uh, the axon actually remains uh, undamaged. So uh, we have uh, um, the um, um, spontaneous regenerative uh, process called remyelination, where here, as you see, a newly uh, oligodendrocytes uh, uh, reform a uh, new myelin seeds. Now, if this uh, is not uh, happening for some reasons, then uh, uh, actually we, uh, there is a lead uh, towards the axonal degeneration. So tissue injury is followed, is followed by a repair process in a normal setting. 
So here, as you see, is a very uh, famous image from a patient that died from uh, uh, multiple scler sclerosis. And here we can see a slice of sub subcortical white matter uh, stained by luxury blue. And with uh, the green arrows, you can see the areas of demyelinating um, uh, lesions, whereas with the uh, red arrows, you can see the so-called shadow plaques, which actually are areas of remyelination. So uh, this image uh, um, provides us with two lessons, is that uh, uh, the remyelination is a spontaneous regenerative process, uh, but many lesions still uh, remain demyelinating, uh, especially in the progressive uh, part of the disease. So um, determining the outcome of the lesions can help us to design uh, um, regenerative medicines uh, so the microglia is a prime therapeutic target for this issue, uh, which is a, because it plays a key functional role in the regenerative process, which actually starts with microglia activation, followed by phenotype, phenotype adaptation and ends in the resolution of the response. So a, a key feature of the microglia is the clearance of the myelin debris following the demyelination process. Uh, previous work from our lab um, has showed that uh, actually myelin debris poses a challenge in microglia in demyelinating lesions. So this is a model uh, of lysolecithin uh, demyelinating uh, lesion in the spinal cord. Uh, and uh, what uh, our colleagues have shown before is that um, uh, in aging, so in aged mice, uh, microglia actually um, uh, fails to buffer uh, uh, the cholesterol that uh, because uh, when we have a demyelinating uh, lesion, uh, the uh, myelin is a lipid rich debris, which is actually uh, a, a rich in cholesterol. And uh, cholesterol cannot be degraded, so it uh, what uh, our uh, lab has showed is that the uh, efflux capacity of the macrophages was impaired in the aged mice, and uh, this led to accumulation of foam cells in lipid, in, in lipid droplets and cholesterol crystals. So uh, the trend to... Uh, following uh, this publication, we want to see what uh, are the key molecules uh, leading um, in uh, this kind of situation. And uh, trend 2 actually uh, is a cell surface that a cell surface receptor that is exp uh, spe um, specifically expressed in microglia and adipocytes. Um, and uh, following by the uh, binding of lipids, uh, it can uh, a downstream signal um, uh, with the DAP12, which is an item, item uh, motif uh, co-receptor, as you can see here. Uh, um, we have the uh, following uh, pathway of the signaling. Um, and um, uh, this signaling actually uh, regulates uh, the phagocytosis, lipid metabolism, and immune response. And previous publications have shown that TREM2 knockout microglia failed to upregulate transcripts implicated in activation, phagocytosis, and lipid metabolism. But still, there is an incomplete understanding of TREM2 dependent lipid processing after tissue injury. So, the aim of our study was to identify the molecules that control lipid metabolism in microglia in demyelinating lesions. And for this, uh, uh, to address this question, we uh, used um, a very famous um, toxin-induced uh, uh, model. So we stereotactically inject in spinal cord uh, lysolecithin in uh, two uh, mouse models. And uh, here you can see uh, the scheme. So uh, four uh, days post-injection, we have a complete demyelination following uh, by uh, the uh, complete remyelination in 21 days post-injection. So, uh, in order to elucidate the role uh, for um, TREM2 in remyelination, 
we uh, used a, a TEM uh, electron microscope analysis and uh, um, we uh, figured out that the, the myelinating actions in the TREM2 knockout in the lesion area uh, uh, are less compared to the wild type. This was also confirmed uh, using the G-ratio methodology. Um, and also uh, in TREM2 knockout uh, lesions, uh, 21 TPI, uh, there is an increase in both uh, extracellular, as here you can see with the red arrowheads, and intracellular myelin debris. Um, Although in uh, uh, wild type, we have uh, the remyelination, as you can see here, uh, in TREM2 knockout, we have uh, here naked actions devoided by uh, myelin six. Um, so uh, we also assessed the inflammation rate in the TREM2 uh, uh, model, the lesion model, and uh, we find out that uh, uh, during uh, the process of uh, the lesion, so from starting from the 4 dpi until the 62 dpi, uh, in the wild type we have the resolution of inflammation uh, that is uh, measured by IBA1 positive cells, although in the TREM2 the resolution um, uh, was not uh, uh, there, so we uh, um, there, uh, we um, uh, um, saw that there is an impact uh, in immune cell resolution in this model. So our next question was, what is the underlying mechanism of defective innate immune cell resolution? So we've, in order to address this question, we focused on uh, the formation of the foam cells. And surprisingly, we saw that in TREM2 knockout, uh, both in 21 dpi until 62 dpi, uh, we have uh, not so many uh, foam cells compared to the wild type in the lesion site. Um, this was also confirmed uh, uh, via immunohistochemistry using a perilipin 2, which is a marker uh, for the lipid droplets, uh, a cell surface protein marker, and we saw that uh, uh, the perilipin 2 uh, double IBA1 positive cells were decreased uh, compared to the wild type uh, in the TREM2 knockout lesions. Um, we, uh, we further wanted uh, to uh, prove that uh, there is a, an impaired lipid droplet biogenesis in the TREM2 knockout. So what we did is that we isolated my primary microglia from TREM2 knockout and wild type, and we treated them with myelin somehow to, um, uh, uh, to establish an in vitro isolation. If I may say it like this. Uh, so what we saw is that uh, in while in wild type, when we treated the cells with myelin for eight and 24 hours, we have an increase in lipid droplet formation in TREM2 that was not the case. And also we further identify the perilipin 2, uh, the lipid droplet uh, levels uh, using Western blot analysis from cells, microglia, primary microglia treated with myelin. Uh, to further uh, analyze um, the impaired lipid droplet biogenesis in the to deficient mice, uh, we uh, performed untargeted lipidomic analysis using primary microglia from wild type and TREM2 treated with myelin debris for eight or uh, 24 hours and 24 hours. And what we saw it, it was that we have less cholesterol esters as long as triglycerides in TREM2 knockout um, and more phosphatidic acid uh, in TREM2 knockout. So this three aspects pointed out that we uh, have impaired lipid droplet biogenesis while the cholesterol ester and triglycerides are the core of the lipid droplet and the phosphatidic acid is a precursor for triglycerides. So uh, the question that um, was followed by this data was, uh, is impaired cholesterol esterification responsible for the poor remyelination? So, so far we used the TREM2 knockout model, but then we decided to switch to another mouse model, which is the ACAT1 knockout. So the ACAT1 is um, an enzyme that is located in the ER and is the responsible enzyme for converting cholesterol to cholesterol ester. 
and then subsequently we have uh, the formation of the lipid droplets. So uh, what we did it was again in uh, using this mouse uh, model, we performed the lysolecithin methodology in the spinal cord, and uh, uh, we have uh, almost no foam cells in the ACAT knockout uh, using again electron microscopy. Um, and uh, when we assessed the remyelination, we found a, a poor remyelination in the ACAT1 knockout in the lesions. Um, this was also, uh, we wanted also to assess the inflammation in this mouse uh, model, and uh, we saw that the inflammation uh, was increased in the, in the lesion, uh, in the ACAT1 uh, knockout compared to the wild type, while uh, the, um, from this graph you can see that the um, uh, phagocytosis in both, uh, it was not uh, the problem why we have uh, um, uh, increased IBO1. Uh, so the phagocytosic capacity of the myelin debris was not affected by this model. Um, so we um, uh, hypothesized that the ability to esterify cholesterol in the form of lipid droplets is a key adaptive function of microglia. And uh, because the triglycerides and um, uh, cholesterol, yes, uh, uh, is actually the primary spot is the ER, uh, we hypothesized that uh, maybe we have activation of ER stress uh, following the lysolecithin, uh, the overload of the myelin debris, uh, and the overload of cholesterol uh, in the ER, uh, and maybe this could represent the underlying reason for impaired lipid droplets formation. So we hypothesized that, that, that the excess cholesterol can be accumulated in the ER, uh, and uh, it has been previously showed that the uh, accumulation of cholesterol in the ER can activate it, the PERC kinase, which subsequently activates and phosphorylates the EAF2A a transcription factor, uh, 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 having an impairment in the protein translation. So um, uh, indeed, using immunohistochemistry, we found out that there is an increase in phospho AF2A uh, microglia uh, cells in the TREM2 knockout. And also this was assessed uh, uh, by the Western blood analysis that both in the trend to knockout, myelin treated the primary microglia, we have an increase uh, in the phospho AF2A and phospho GNK, which is a primary actually kinase that further contrib contributes to the phosphorylation of the AF2A. Uh, so all of this uh, pointed out to an impairment in the protein translation. So we wanted to assess the protein synthesis and the rate of the protein synthesis of the trem to deficient mice. So what we did is that we um, injected opiopuromycin, uh, which is a, a peptide that uh, incorporates to newly polypeptide, nascent polypeptide uh, proteins. Uh, polypeptided uh, chains, um, and uh, what we saw is that uh, the, in the TREM2 knockout, uh, the intensity of the opipuromycin was decreased, pointing out that there is uh, an impairment in protein synthesis. We also uh, turned to the in vitro setting and treated the, the cells uh, microglia with uh, puromycin and uh, uh, we, uh, we identified the incorporation of puromycin and both here, as you can see, while we treated the cells uh, with myelin in eight, for eight hours, we could see uh, no difference between wild type and TREM2, but when we continue measuring the incorporation of the puromycin treating uh, 24 hours with myelin, uh, then we saw a significant decrease in the incorporation, pointing out again an impairment of uh, the translation of proteins. So all of this data pointed out that uh, there is a myelin debris uptake in the TREM2 knockout microglia that results in near stress and suppression of protein translation. And we, uh, we hypothesized that maybe this is the, key, the reason for impaired lipid droplet biogenesis. So um, we asked if alleviating ER stress can, could improve lipid droplet biogenesis in the TREM2. Uh, mice. 
Uh, so we used the PBA, which is um, a, a very uh, well established um, agent that uh, alleviates ear stress. Uh, actually, it works in the phospho, in the PERC uh, kinase pathway. Um, and uh, we, we injected the mice uh, every day with uh, PBA. And what we saw is that uh, while in the TREM2 knockout, untreated uh, um, situation, the, pre, the lipid droplet um, uh, levels were decreased. When we treated uh, the mice with PBA, we, we saw an increase in uh, uh, the formation of lipid droplets in microglia cells. Uh, this was also confirmed in the in vitro setting while uh, we treated uh, uh, both uh, the primary microglia with myelin and PBA, we saw uh, an uh, increase in the formation of lipid droplets. Uh, we also assessed the inflammation rate uh, for uh, uh, using uh, the PBA uh, and uh, we saw uh, well in animals that we injected PBA that the inflammation um, was decreased. So uh, we pointed out that there is a beneficial effect of PBA in the resolution of the inflammation and uh, that lipid-induced ear stress contributes to impaired lipid droplet formation in the TREM2 knockout mice. So to sum up all the story, uh, cholesterol esterification in microglia is, necessary, is a necessary adaptive response to myelin debris uptake and it's required for generation of lipid droplets upon injury. Uh, when the lipid droplet by genesis is impaired, innate immune cells do not resolve and the whole response fails. Uh, TREM2 knockout mice are unable to adapt to excess cholesterol exposure, so they form fewer lipid droplets and build up ear stress. And uh, if we try to mitigate ear stress in TREM2 knockout mice, the, we have a restorage in lipid droplet biogenesis and a resolution of the innate immune response. So the main key um, point that the, um, our story had is that a TREM2 dependent formation of lipid droplets constitute a protective response required for remyelination to occur. And with that, I really hope that I'm on time. Uh, I would like uh, to thank um, all the members of our lab, uh, Mikhail Simon's lab, and uh, especially Ludovico Cantuti Castelvetri, which we did uh, uh, the same amount of work uh, for this project and I learned a lot of uh, a lot from him and I thank him very very much but of course all the uh, co-authors that contributed to the story um, and uh, all the collaborators uh, and of course I wanted to thank you uh, again Open Box Science for the lovely um, initiative and uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work. And uh, uh, thank you, Jinping, for moderating the whole uh, event. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Garavalia. It's a fantastic talk. Uh, well, we're waiting for the chat. Uh, I actually have a question. So maybe I missed mix this too. Is um, so the knockout of TREM two and the ACTA one won't mm -hmm. affect the uh, phagocytosis of the myelin. Right, it's just the lipid droplet synthesis, lipid droplet present is less. Well, so my question is like, will the microglia that in, still engulf those myelin, but they don't further probably digest or process it into form lipid droplet, will they just stay where they are and as it is, or they will die more with the loaded of the myelin that cannot further process? <laughs> That's a very good uh, question. Um, we actually, uh, uh, in the TREM2 knockout mice, we, um, uh, in the 21 DPI, we had uh, some uh, accumulation of myelin debris, uh, but uh, we also had the question, what is happening after 21 days, as you very well asked. So, uh, just here. Um, yeah, so here we only see 21 DPI, but the, um, uh, we as I think that we assessed and we saw that uh, there is not so much myelin debris in the 62 DPI, in the microglia, uh, in the, the trend to knockout, but uh, I'm not very sure I have to take it again. 
Uh, but the very, the very, um, a very nice um, aspect of your question is uh, how to assess if there is uh, some um, uh, necrosis or apoptosis in this model. And this we haven't checked, uh, but uh, it's a very nice question to see if uh, uh, we have, um, yeah, this kind of aspects uh, in a later time point. Cool. Uh, Jan Rong, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Or I can read it from the chat. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the lipid droplet laden microglia in the aged brain that have been previously shown to be more inflammatory? Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. Uh, so there is, uh, in the field, there is, um, there are actually both uh, opinions that the uh, accumulation of lipid droplets is bad, and uh, uh, but uh, the, the other opinion is that the uh, accumulation of lipid droplets actually is a buffer mechanism that uh, uh, protects, uh, uh, for example, for, uh, from the toxic uh, variants of cholesterol, of free cholesterol. So, um, I believe that there is a balance uh, that if we have um, uh, um, a model that uh, uh, recapitulates aging, somehow this tries uh, the, the buffering of lipids, uh, tries uh, to, how can I pause, um, to, I'm sorry, just tries, um, to be uh, more uh, like on the health side, um, but uh, uh, when we have um, a model, for example, like a uh, uh, lysolecithin model or a cubizon model, then maybe uh, there is another uh, reading uh, regarding the lipid droplets uh, formation uh, on the brain. And it's fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I answered your question. Okay, cool. Uh, actually, I also have a, maybe I also mix up this. It's like uh, the uh, the no lipid droplets uh, leads to ER stress and then leads to protein, newly synthesized protein. It's not, um, it's not present or the other way around. So I guess my question is like, will this ER stress leading to like uh, no, uh, like less of the newly transcribed of the translation directly impact the myelin protein synthesis instead of through the lipid droplet and then the remyelination. So uh, actually, uh, that's a very good point. What we saw in our uh, study was, uh, or actually what I hypothesized was that uh, the accumulation of cholesterol in the ER uh, uh, led to, an, uh, ER, to the ER stress, which actually attenuated the protein translation. Uh, and then when we try to alleviate the ER stress, we saw that lipid droplets start to formate. So uh, we could not say that, uh, um, yes, so uh, we saw that uh, if we don't have lipid droplets, then uh, we somehow uh, uh, point through the UPR, through the ER stress pathway, we have the attenuation of the protein translation. So uh, yes, the, the no uh, lipid droplets, um, uh, the, the, the no presence of the lipid droplets uh, turned out to um, uh, attenuating the protein translation. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Is there any other question? Sorry, I have another question. <laughs> so it's like okay. a... no, no, no. <laughs> I like to be silenced. I'm very bad in uh, in answering questions, as you realized actually. But I really, I'm really here for it. <laughs> so I think well, I will add that the future of like this direction. It seems like the lipid droplet forming is like kind of like a recycle for like the material building block for like a milding repair to happen. Like, I wonder what's your thoughts on like how to see or uh, because cholesterol lipids uh, is certified uh, cholesterol, how they, will they just got transferred to 
the oligodendrocytes or OPC to, for, for them to use for the new form, the myelin sheets. Um, well, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good uh, point, actually. And uh, um, um, there is a really um, nice aspect of it. So if, because we know that cholesterol cannot be degraded. So when we have a setting uh, of uh, the demyelination uh, injury, then all of this uh, chol free cholesterol has to be used somehow. So uh, yes, I, uh, if I can comment, uh, I believe, or there are some evidence that maybe uh, this uh, um, cholesterol um, somehow buffered uh, or in, in the form of the lipid droplets or extracellular in uh, other uh, particles uh, can maybe potentially can be used by um, another cell type in this kind of setting. But uh, to my knowledge, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't know any literature that has successfully showed this kind of recycling that you very nicely described. <laughs> yeah, but it would make sense. It would make sense. Right, it gotta be going somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, it's about time. So let's thank Garifali again, and then let's welcome our next speaker.